Throughout my adult life, my focus has been on making the world a more beautiful place. Initially, I pursued this goal as a hairstylist, working on the external appearance of individuals to make them feel more beautiful. However, I wanted more, so I began to shift my focus to helping people make better choices and achieve greater beauty from within. As a transformational life coach, I specialize in helping you identify and change the limiting beliefs that may be holding you back. Join me each week as we discuss, interview, teach, and explore the fundamental principles of healthy relationships. Welcome to Conscious Conversations with Louisa. Hello, everyone. I am Louisa Yovanovich. We are here with my amazing new friend, Sydney Jackson. And, you know, I only got to know you a couple of weeks ago and you blew my mind. I was not expecting to get on a phone call and all of a sudden be stopped in my tracks with your story. And it was so powerful. It was so profound. It was so kind of shook me to my core too. Like I can't, I can't lie. I, I really, you know, I'm one of those people who it takes a lot to shake me to my core and, and your story went and who you are and the, what, what you have come through to, even as we were starting, you're like, I went paragliding and then I got on a meeting and then here I am. And it, from your story, a lot of people would be sitting in the corner rocking back and forth and you are living an, a really a powerful life past the stories. And I just couldn't help myself but want to interview you because I think that the whole world gets to one, hear your story and two, be inspired by what is possible. So Sydney, oh. welcome to Conscious Conversations with Luis. I'm dying to have the everyone else get to know you. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I we did only meet a few weeks ago and it was really even for me, like I felt like it was one of those phone calls that you instantly are talking to someone that you're like you are an amazing impactful person. And I think that's so just rare sometimes. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, um, I'm so honored and so excited to be here to share my story with you guys and, and just get to know you better. And it'll be so fun. I'm so excited. It is going to be really great. I, I could already feel one of the things that I love about life is reverse engineering. Like I could already feel the impact this is going to make. And we haven't even had the conversation yet. I already know the energetic space it's creating. So let's, let's actually start from you as a child and your family story. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I would say I definitely had a little bit of a different childhood than, than probably most. I don't think I, I choose to look at it as I don't feel like I necessarily had a negative, terrible awful childhood, but it was probably different than most families. Uh, me and my mom went back and were writing down dates kind of, of, of everything that happened in sequential order. And it was about once a year that something tragic hit our family. Sorry. Um, (laughs) well, I mean, depends on what we want to dive into, you know, but what we'll just, we'll jump with this. My family has a genetic disorder called leaf Romani syndrome, and it affects our ability to fight, not only fight cancer, but we just develop it all the time. It's a very rare genetic disorder. The doctors up at Huntsman described it as you're not our average freaks of nature. So when they tell you that you're like, Oh, thank you. I I appreciate that. So my little sister passed away when she was a month away from her fourth birthday from rhabdomyosarcoma. And then my dad, I mean, he had, when he passed away, we counted that up too, because you do start to lose count. You're trying to survive these things as they hit you 
you know? So it was, it was really cool experience to actually sit down and go, holy cow, we kind of have been through a lot, haven't we? But my dad, by the time he passed away just a few years ago, he had had cancer between eight to 10 times. And that's different types. That's colon cancer, brain tumor, lung cancer, a tumor by his heart, a tumor in his throat, skin cancers. I mean, he fought them all and was just an incredible, incredible person. He ran triathlons and marathons and did an Ironman. You know, nothing slowed my dad down. There was a time, yeah, he was incredible. There was a time that I went to visit him at the hospital and to be totally honest, he looked like he was on death's doorstep. I mean, for anyone, most of us at this point of life, I feel like have experienced cancer, whether it's us, a loved one, or just someone we know, or seen it, you know, TV, whatever, that when people go through chemotherapy, they are a shell physically of, of who they are. They're yellow, they're bald, they're, you know, just look like they're on death's door. And, um, this was when he had one of the tumors, uh, lung cancer. And I went to visit him. And walking in, laying, seeing him laying there that day specifically, I was like, it just, it just rocked me to my core. I was like, how is he with us right now? He, there's no way. And the doctors were saying the same thing. There's no way he's going to be here very long. And he was running a triathlon the next month. And that's what he told me laying there. He's like, I've got to get ready. I've got to be training. I need to, I've got to, I got to get out there. I've got my triathlon next month. And I'm going, okay, dad you know, I love you. Yeah. We, we're going to do that. Like in my brain going, it's really good to, you know, keep your brain on other things when you're stuck in a hospital bed. Oh, hell no. Pardon my language, but no, he was out there doing this triathlon a month later. And I mean, he was just such a wonderful person, but you know, we were constantly dealing with those things. I mean, you think of cancer between eight to 10 times. I mean, it was just, there was always somebody sick. I got cancer. My first time I had cancer when I is when I was 12 years old and I got diagnosed with breast cancer and we went up to primary, primary children's here in Salt Lake. They said, we don't treat breast cancer. We're, we're a children's hospital. So we're going to send you up to Huntsman. And that's where I got all my treatment done and everything done. Um, my brother was diagnosed with um, osteosarcoma when he was 12 as well. And they had to half amputate his leg. He had a prosthetic leg. And unfortunately it moved from his um, leg to his lungs, which is a weird thing with osteosarcoma that I guess is pretty typical, but then into his spine before he passed away. So yeah, so childhood for me was a little different. I remember sitting on the playground when I was probably six, five or six, when my sister was sick and looking around at the kids on the playground and they're all running and screaming and jumping and going down the slides. And I was just sitting on a curb looking, watching them all. And I just felt like I'm not a part of this anymore. I, I don't feel like I relate to these, to these kids. I mean, I wanted to be sitting down and talking about the meaning of life or if we're going to die or live or, and, you know, I wasn't worried about going down the slide anymore. You know, I was worried about if my sister was going to be alive when I got home from school that day. Right. So, wow. yeah. That was kind of grown up in my family was wondering who was next, what they were getting. <laughs> Is the person that has it right now going to survive? So. What was your relationship like? Like, how was your mom in being a mom while trying to hold it together for the whole family? You know, I think as adults, as we grow older, we look back on things and we, we realize that parents are people too. You know, and I, as a mom now, I have one daughter, her name is Lainey and she's eight and she's my entire world. And as a mom now with just one, just one daughter and she does have a brain tumor, but I just the stress that, that you have to work through going, when am I getting cancer next? Right. 
what's going to happen for her, which one of us is going to die first. I mean, that's not usually something that goes through your mind all the time as a younger healthy mom with a young daughter wondering, you know, who, who's going to outlive who and what's best case. I mean, it's just, you know, so I, when I look at that, I think, I, I just think how, how she tried to do that with, you know, having four kids and one of us always sick and my dad always sick. I mean, that's a lot. That's That's a lot. lot. I, I think about myself and being a single mom of two and really like holding it together. But when I think about health, you know, the, the very few times knock on wood, thank God that like my children have had something going on. It has actually like been the game changer of my fear. Yeah. I can say I can manage fear as long as there's yeah. not a health issue. Right. You know, like that condition as yeah. long as. And so when I experience people who have had such trauma what is the mindset you have to uh, have to like embody and be with in order to make it through that I think there's a couple big things one of the things that I try to focus on a lot is positivity right being positive working on a positive mindset but I think there's a beautiful other side to that too of acceptance you know, it is the saying, it is what it is, right? I mean, we can sit and lay in bed at night and stress ourselves into a ball and make ourselves sick thinking about exactly what I was talking about, right? I could lay there at night and just roll and toss and turn and wonder all, you know, who's, who's when's late, how long is Laney going to be here? How long am I going to be here? Oh my gosh, you know, or just go, wow, life is a really beautiful thing and it's a beautiful experience that we all get to be a part of every single day and we get so busy trying to focus on the future all the time which is a wonderful thing I'm a very goal-oriented type a personality I'm all (laughs) I'm all about those things running businesses but to be able to just slow down and realize that number one we're not in control of really, if we sit down and truly break down, what are we in control of? Our attitude, our mindset. Like every minute, it's it's our only minute. Like we, time is now, it's our only minute. You know, what? one of the things that fascinated me is like during this time with everything what you're going through, you actually fell in love and got married. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Yeah, so short, um, I was running my own business, horse training business. That was my dream as a little girl. And I was very blessed to be able to fulfill that to the fullest. And I mean, it was a lot of hard work. Do not get me wrong. I, I could go on for days. How old were you during this time? How old were you during this time? Um, I started my horse training business, I think exactly when I was 20. So 20 years old, I was running my own business and it was all, it was wonderful. It's a lot of work, all the things. And, uh, I met a very, 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 very special, wonderful person. And we started dating and fell in love and we got married. It was a beautiful experience. And I, I was not a little girl who visualized what is my wedding dress going to look like someday what is I mean I was so busy focused on horses and all the other things and being a tomboy that what was my wedding dress going to look like was the farthest thing from my mind but when the moment came all of a sudden it was like oh I get to pick colors I get to, I didn't wear I mean I, I didn't do all the high school dances because I was working I mean I, I started a cleaning business when I was 16 as soon as I had a car I ran my own cleaning business and made money that way so that I could work and train and do the intern thing with the horses and all the stuff. So and there just wasn't time to worry about that stuff. So going dress shopping was actually so fun and exciting and this cool new experience for me to go to go try on a bunch of pretty fancy dresses. And it, it, it really, and our wedding day was just for me what I would 
everything I could have hoped for. It was so fun. And we were married for three years and my husband passed away. And shortly after my husband passed away is when we found my daughter's brain tumor. At the, the, he passed away in the fall and we found that out in the spring. I, this, I remember like hearing your story and then it was like the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And I thought, how does one muscle up the strength to to show up every day powerfully like i you know i get the time is now the attitude but like where do you really go to in the in the core of your core is the what is the like core belief that has you so unshakable i think it's that I think it's jumping back to it. So it's two main things I would say. And one, I'd really say that you can look at everything with a negative or a positive. And for me, the positive of having this disorder is it makes you appreciate life on a whole different level. And when you wake up with an appreciation for life, everything is beautiful, right? That's when, when I say life is beautiful, I look at, you know, I could be having the worst day in the world, but I'm driving down the road going, wow. That, those mountains, the sky today, oh, everything is so beautiful. But also, I think it's just like a, like a fighter of some sort, right? Like you just learn how to take punches. You either learn how to take the punches or you end up on the mat and it's over and it's done. But I think being a fighter without the appreciation is also not as helpful. Because then when you hit the mat, you think you are done and you're not. There have been, and I'm, you know, I do wake up and try to find the most positive mindset, most powerful mindset of the day, truly every day. And I try to evaluate myself multiple times a day. I, after I lost my husband, I was in a very dark place, struggling mentally, struggling emotionally. It was a hole that I had never been in. I mean, I'd lost my sister and my brother and my dad at that point. And me and my brother were so, so close. Best, best friends. When he passed away, I remember thinking all the time, nothing will ever be as hard as this. Nothing could possibly be as hard as this. He was truly the best friend that I've ever had and will ever have. Nothing will ever be harder. I was wrong. Losing my husband. Uh, I lost him to suicide unexpectedly. And that was harder. At, during that time when I was just stuck emotionally, stuck mentally, there truly was a point that I was laying in bed. I shared this with you that I thought maybe I'm going to do hard drugs just to try to get rid of some of this pain for us for everyone, which again, most people have, for anyone who's lost people that they love in life, there's nothing more painful to me that I've experienced than losing our loved ones and losing that, not only them, but there's also always a piece of you that you know goes with them that I think we mourn as well. So sitting there, I just thought, I'm in so much pain. There's, you know, maybe I could do hard drugs temporarily to get rid of this because this is so painful. And the next morning I sat on my couch and I was trying to journal. I was trying to write things down, trying to sort through my emotions because I instantly sat out of bed when that thought went through my head. I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to do hard drugs. So clearly we need to come up with something. So sitting on my couch the next morning, journaling things out, the thing that kept coming back to me over and over and just hitting me like the broadside of the barn was that everyone had told me my whole life, oh, you're such a positive person. We love how positive you are. And I kind of looked at myself in my sweatpants, head, hair mess, you know, makeup, and just the whole nine yards. And I was like, man, I sure don't feel positive right now. I feel the farthest thing from that that I possibly could be. So I wanted to hold myself accountable 
for my mindset. I, you know, jumping back to our conversation earlier, right? That is the only thing we can control. That is it. That is all is our mindset. Now that doesn't mean that we have control of it all the time. It means that we learn tools, we get resources, we put it into practice, and we do a lot of hard work that comes with having a good mindset. Because I think people a lot of the time do. They think, oh, well, why are you just so happy all the time? That's so great for you. You don't understand. I have these hard things going on in my life. And if I, if I could be happy like you, that'd be awesome. All of us can. And that's what's so cool and so powerful about it. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to slip and we're not going to slide and we're not going to have terrible days, terrible moments. We feel like a piece of crap, whatever it is. But it's that we're trying. It's that we're putting in the effort. It's that we're looking for resources. It's that when we, when we find things that are a problem, we're addressing them. So I wanted to hold myself accountable. I made what I call the positivity scale. So I pulled out a piece of paper and I wrote down the days of the week on one column and then crossways columns like this. And I wrote down events right here and put positive and negative signs down the side. And every day before I go to bed, I picked the three main events that happened that day. Just the three things that popped into my head that I felt were big, small, it didn't really matter. I'd write them all down and I would circle whether those were positive or negative. And then I made a separate column that said reaction with positive and negative. So I'd have to circle whether the three main events were positive or whether they were negative. And then I had to hold myself accountable for my reaction. Was my reaction negative or positive? This is gold. This is gold. Yeah. So my book should be out soon on Amazon. So I'm super excited about that. But I, I made a journal for everyone to use, a positivity journal. But to be able to, at the end of the week, I mean, at the end of the day, end of the week, but total it up and go, how am I doing? I get to check on me. How am I doing? Am I, you know, it could be, it could because we have positive events going on all around us all the time, but we're stuck in a negative headspace. It could be grandma brought you cookies and you, you were frustrated with grandma because grandma, you know, you had a million things to do. They didn't really have time for grandma or, you know, I mean, however you choose to view it, you can have wonderful positive things going on and still be technically having a negative reaction. You're not, a, you're not in that headspace. Absolutely. I remember I'm a hairdresser. So I used to stand behind people's chair and tell them about my life. And in my twenties, what I was telling people was poor me. I mean, I had parents who raised me and gave me more love than a child could dream of. And the story I was telling was like, oh, poor me, right? And and then there's children who are who are like, just look happy that they got fed dinner. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't get what I wanted. Yeah. So how did you come up with that? The columns and the positive and negative, like how did that come to you? I really don't know, to be totally honest. I was just sitting there and that's what I decided to do. I thought, you know, what, how, how am I going to hold myself accountable? And that's what I came up with, just sitting there. That's what I did. I don't know. And it worked. And the cool thing was to watch it trend up and up and up and up was like the feeling that comes with like knowing, like I didn't have to, I didn't have to look at those numbers to know that I was doing better because I could feel it. I call it collecting evidence. Yeah. It like, was I either collect evidence that empowers me or I collect evidence that disempowers me. And for a long time, I was collecting evidence. If like two people said that I didn't do well at something, I would dwell on that. But then it's like, do you know how many people say we're extraordinary? And I was ignoring that. And how many people, because I love working out. Yeah. But I didn't always love working out. It was the fact that I re I now think about this, like when you're taking an aerobics class, the person who's teaching is screaming for an hour, positive things that used to physically light me up. It would be like subliminal messages for an hour being programmed in my brain each day of you could do it one more minute, five more, four more, three, like. I didn't know what that was. I do now. Yeah. And that's why I love working out because I could go into class feeling like I'm dying and that I, I have nothing to give in here. 
by the time I'm done, I've actually now worked out and I have more energy than I came in with. Yeah. I, I love working out and for the same reason. Yeah. And, and it's the, those moments, it's what you created. And, you know, each person has their own gift. When I asked you, where did you learn it? Like somebody gets this download and then the universe gets to benefit from that download. And yeah. you have had downloads that has like impacted yourself. And then you get to go into the world and share it and impact others. Yesterday, I was saying how uh, I told one of my friends, clients, that all she had to do was find two things about her husband each day that she could give him generous uh, feedback of what she appreciated that day. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and I also said for ourselves, give ourselves the feedback we're thinking they're going to give us because right. I was the wife who was looking for my husband to appreciate me that way I would know I was worthy. And so while I told her to give him two pieces of information that works, the other two is like, give it to yourself yeah. because I used to look for the world to tell me I was worth something. Yeah. I think that, I think that's something, especially nowadays, that's huge. I think that's huge. I think that's so big in our society right now. How many likes do I have? Right. How many follows do I have? Well, if I didn't get enough likes on this picture, then I'm, I'm not cool or I'm not, you know, good. Or I mean, so right. many ridiculous things. I think it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man or having that inner confidence of yourself that you're enough. And you know what? We all have things to work on as a reality, right? I mean, and we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. And, and accepting and not when I say accepting weaknesses that doesn't mean just rolling over and being like oh I really suck at this and I could that you know but just accepting that we're all human and and not looking like you said not looking for that value from other people and I think one of the things that helps I think something that's helped me with that a lot since a young age is having passions like having a passion, like an extreme passion for something, whether it's, you know, painting, drawing, running, for me, riding horses or lots of those things, or, you know, but I think our self, when you think of self-worth and us having it, there's actually a podcast that I really love. That's like a motivational with that one, but they're like the only per like you <laughs> to gain self-confidence, you have to know you. And you have to push you and you have like, you know, it's, it's not like we can just be like, I'm a great person and I love myself. That's not how that works. Wouldn't that be nice if it was, if we could just be like, I'm a wonderful person and now I love myself. No, that's not how it works at all. You know, you have to, you have to evaluate for you. What is a great person? Absolutely. And then go, how do, what do I need to do to get there for me? And, you know, it, it, it shouldn't necessarily, in my opinion, it shouldn't come from likes from others. It should come from, am I holding myself to the standards that I find, you know, in, in a good human, in these humans I admire? I mean, I what I'm also hearing from the way you share this is being intentional, being yeah. very committed to our intention because it gives us the why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. And I recently did learn it's a hundred percent intention, zero percent mechanism. Oh, I like that. Dive into that deeper. So anytime, I mean, a hundred percent, anytime I have ever had the intention of doing something, all I had to do was be committed to my intention and the how to shows up yeah. in between that. So it could have 500 different ways. Right. Like we could get to point B 500 different ways. And all we have to know is we want to get to point B. Yeah. We need point B. And yeah. so the intention is I'm getting to point B. And then the how to is like, it could be this way, it could be that way. And it shows up once the intention is set. A hundred percent. Yeah. I agree with that. One hundred and ten percent. 
And even sure. in my course, like I, I did get certified to teach the eight week course, which is how we met. Yeah. And I took the course and the, the very first week of the course is no expectations. So I had collapsed expectations and intentions. I did not realize I had collapsed them. And so I was like, of course I have expectations. Like who in their right mind does <laughs> have expectations? <laughs> I didn't realize I had, of course, now being certified to teach the course I get, set an intention, have no expectations to how you're going to get there. Yeah. Because it really can, you'll miss the how to, if it, if we expect it to look a certain way. And that's not working. I'm like, I would be giving up going, well, it's not working. Yeah. But if I have no expectation and I just have an intention, then the how-to shows up. Yeah, 100%. I love that. And I love that breakout of that. Because again, you would you would hear the words expectation and intention. Or a lot of people, like you said, think, yeah, well, those those are the same thing pretty much. No, they are. those are two very, <laughs> very different things. And I think that how you described that was beautiful and perfect, but yeah, intentions are huge and it's amazing when we pick a path, no matter what that path is. And unfortunately, this definitely, I think goes negative and positive, just like everything else in, in life, you know, but I think once you, like, if you do set an intention to do something negative and terrible, it's change you're going to happen that way too. Right. But but on the positive end of things, when you set positive intentions for goals for life, what you want to be doing, whether it's in work, whether it's in, in home life, whether it's in, you know, personal relationship life, like you set those intentions out there and they just blossom. They blossom. I mean, they, they, they really do. Like you said, it, it may not be how you think, which is why you shouldn't stress about how you're going to get there. Make a plan. You can make plans, but it can all, you know, if, you have those expectations you're going to feel like that like you said that plan failed you know what's really interesting about this that i'm feeling right now is sometimes i've done things thinking my intentions were good but then unless i'm sharing it with someone else i didn't realize i was still for example i was making a list of all the things i want in a partner right so i and then i got to share it and you know what people heard all the things I didn't want. It's not what I intended to write. I didn't actually know how to write what I wanted because I was writing a lot of what hadn't worked and I was focused on that. So I was like clear on what I didn't want. I just didn't know how to write what I did want. So what yeah. was I generating and manifesting? All of the things I didn't want because it's where I was connecting with. Yeah, a hundred percent. So that is one of the main things Sorry, I have kind of a stuffy nose today, but I'm glad we got to do this. I, that is one of the main things that I teach when I'm working with people on. So I'm a reigning trainer, which for anyone listening that doesn't know what that is, look it up. It is so cool and so fun. It's R-E-I-N-I-N-G, reigning. Uh, but with the reigning courses, we teach them to spin, we teach them to slide, a bunch of cool stuff. Everybody nowadays is like, oh, like on Yellowstone. There's like a clip like this long on Yellowstone of a sliding horse for a second. So but anyway, so when you're riding or, or just working with horses in general, even on the ground, but especially once you become that partner in, in that leadership role with riding, if you, that they can feel every single thought that passes through your head, every single one, which is the coolest thing in the world about horses, but, um, if you are, so let's just give an example, right? Because this, this is true with riding a horse and this is true exactly what we're talking about in life. If you don't want a horse to speed up, if you're riding and you're thinking, don't speed up, horses can read every thought, but the only word that God left out of their dictionary is don't. So <laughs> cross, just take a red marker. I would do this on my whiteboard when I'm working with people. I'd be like, take a red marker and just cross that don't out. What is your horse feeling from you? speed up. What do they do? Speed up. They, that is the only thing they are drawing from you. And yeah. so to them, they, they don't understand why all of a sudden everybody's upset and 
a really cool example was I had a lady bring a young horse in that she'd been having a problem with and had been bucking her off. And when she'd get on, it would speed up and take off. And then it would end up bucking. And it was just this terrible situation for her, dangerous. And she brings me the horse into training. And I rode the horse a couple of times and I called her and I said, okay, the horse is great. She's like, well, what are you talking about? She, you know, she's just da, 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 da. And I said, why don't we need to have you start taking lessons? She's safe. Cause I, I won't, I'll take horses in, I'll do evaluation. And then when I feel it is safe, then I will let the owners come start taking their lessons and stuff. But liability wise, I can't know that this lady's getting fucked off her horse and in good conscience, bring her in and say, okay, get on. Right. We know it's going to happen. Right. So I said, so let's work on you. Let's come take some lessons. And she said, okay, I'll be there. And I showed her, I got on her horse and we just started walking around the arena and she's like, well, how are you doing that? I said, what do you mean? She said, how are you doing that? I said, she said, as soon as I swing on, she instantly starts trotting, then she's loping, then she's bucking. Just as soon as my butt hits the saddle, she said, how are you, how is she just walking around the arena? And I said, it's all about what you're thinking. And she looked at me like I was nuts, right? She's like, oh, huh? what? Like, come again? Like, she can see it happening in real time. But she's also like, no, that's, that's no, it's got to be something bigger than that. No, it's not. Right. And I said, it's about what I'm thinking. Well, I knew if I put her on that horse that she, we would have the same thought patterns, we muscle memory, all of the things, and she probably would get bucked off, right? So I explained to her, it's about what you're thinking. I had a horse saddled up for her and I said, go swing on that horse. Okay. I said, he's old. He's like late teens. The kids ride him. Go get on. She kind of, okay. So she walks over, gets the horse swings on. And within a few minutes, that horse very safely, because he's old and just calm, but started trotting around. And she's like, well, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? I don't want him doing that. See, I'm not squeezing my legs. Why does this horse keep doing that? And I said, but what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking, you told me it's about what I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, don't speed up. And I said, I didn't have my whiteboard. We were outside. I said, okay. I said, just start thinking. Relax. Slow down. And that horse, she took some deep breaths and just, you saw her body just turn into jello and that horse instantly started walking. Yeah. So riding horses is a great way to train your brain how to take anything negative. Like, don't, I don't, I don't want this to happen. No matter what it is, you have to be able mentally to spin it around into what you want to happen. And it's, it's a very powerful way to train your brain. Also very, you know, dangerous because when you're thinking don't buck, you know, it's hard to in the moment, <laughs> you know, but you do, you learn how to handle it and you learn how to mentally process that. So I think that has been a huge, huge part of my journey for me. I mean, horses are so therapeutic in, in being, they just really cool. are. I had a moment with a, a couple moments with a horse, but one of them, like, I kept trying to lead the horse, trying keyword. And the second, the second I would drop my leadership the horse would just oh, yeah. go up on its own yeah and the person who was teaching me with the horse she goes you lost it I was like it just, it just actually drove me nuts because I didn't <laughs> feel I mean I felt when I dropped it but how wild to have to like hold that space you know I didn't yeah. it's, it, it's an acquired skill to keep that space so elevated that the and and what I realized is the horse feels safe when we are leading it, and it's why it needs. You know, one of my clients that I was working with, she was struggling with a mom who was really giving her a hard time with work, and I said she's not feeling safe. The reason she's pushing back with you is because she doesn't feel safe. The minute she knows you are in your leadership. She'll not, she won't give you a hard time anymore. Mm -hmm. That's true for all leadership. Like we're even for parents, like I was always looking for my parents to create that level of safety. So I knew I was in good hands. Yeah. So we, I did equine therapy for five years in a program with girls 
of a ranging from ranging from 12 to 18. And the stories that came out of there, I mean, I could again talk for days about the most incredible experiences doing that work. But it was cool to one of the girls just talking about your story. One of the girls, we had like a system, right? That we applied, we taught them with the horses, the girls and the horses, and then they were able to apply it within their family from parents to kids and, and it would go both ways. And one of the girls was pushing, one of the big problems was that she'd push her boundaries, right? And push and push and push. And one of the girls had her mom out for a visit and started just pushing those boundaries and pushing those boundaries and pushing those boundaries. And the mom kept caving and caving and caving. And finally the girl looked at her and said, mom, you know the, the system. What is your job when I push your boundaries? The girl had been doing it all day, just trying to get her mom to find that assertiveness and to find that leadership. She was craving that leadership and those boundaries, which is something, you know, teenage girls, teenagers in general, especially don't think they want or don't think they need, but there is something deep inside. Oh, they, sure. they do. And they crave that structure and they crave those, you know, things that do help keep them safe. Absolutely. But, My daughter I mean, said it to me. My daughter's 15 years old and we were driving one day and she said, you know, this one of my friend's moms, she doesn't care what she does and she doesn't ever keep an eye on her. And I don't think she, I, I know that she doesn't feel very loved because her mom doesn't care what she's doing. Yeah. And, you know, as a mom, it's so powerful to hear our children saying that because they're not saying, oh, you know, she'll ask me to allow her to do things. But I could tell with that, she's also saying, please set boundaries because I do feel that that equals love. Yeah, 100%. And it's the same, you know, like saying with a leader, right? With Whether it's in a job, same right. thing. We want to know what the expectations are of us. We want to know, you know, that we're safe to go talk to the leader of that team if we have an issue, that we can ask questions, that we can, I mean, cultivating an environment where we're all of the same, like we all are, it's, we all have the same purpose, Absolutely. you know, and we are a team. And a team, not always, but a lot of the time requires one good leader. And like you said, with a horse, that's, that's got to be you at literally at every second that you are with them because they will push those boundaries as well. It's nature for them. They right. have to have a leader in the dynamic. So if you are not going to show, and this is not physical, this is not, you know, it is, it is a presence. It's, right. it's, it's owning your space. It's setting an expectation. A lot of people will try to physically um, intimidate a horse to be its leader. No, that's that you're you're gonna have you know one of two responses. They are fight or flight. And you're so gonna, are children. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so, so are children. A hundred. Tried that with my kids, and and it did not work. But I want to go back to the part with the horse and the intention setting because. I think this was so powerful. So when I was about to work with the horse, the lady said, set an intention. And I said, you know what? I want the horse to show me like what I get to learn today. I'm open to the horse sharing with me where I get to learn. I forgot I said that. She recorded me saying that we moved on. And then I have the whole session with the horse and she says, and I'm a tiny, tiny person. I'm only five <laughs> feet tall. So she says, put your body and belly up against the belly's horse, uh, the horse's belly. And then you could talk to the horse and you could like tell it what she wants. And I'm like, okay, good luck with that. And she goes, match your breath to the horse, like almost do a meditation with the horse. I'm like, got it. So I'm trying to do that. And she goes, you could talk to the horse and see what it says to you. And it'll listen to anything you say. And I'm like, okay, so I'm doing that. And all I'm getting back from the horses, it wants me to listen to it. The horse wanted me to, to just be quiet and listen to the horse. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. So that was, what did the horse say? What did you say to the horse? Like the horse wanted me to listen to the horse and not it, like it wasn't interested in what I had to say. Then she sends me the recording of when I said the intention. <laughs> and were you like, oh, that's, how powerful I said I wanted to learn from the horse and what did the horse teach me I'm going to lead you that is so cool and 
you know, they really, <laughs> they really, horses are so fun because they do have their own personality, just like people, every single one in every, in, in every way. Like I know, like I can honestly say, I know horses with a great sense of humor. Like you would <laughs> think that, that is a trait that, that would come with a horse, but oh, it's 110%. And I know other horses with no sense of humor. I mean, they are serious. They are business. They are, you know, I mean, they're, they are just like people. Some make easy attachments, you know, some are very hard to attach with. Some don't meet, don't care here nor there, whether they have a lot of attachment or don't. And some are lost without good relationships and that human attachment. And so it's so, it's so cool, but they are also like, so willing to meet you where you are and with what you need. They are the most giving animals, in my opinion, on the planet. I mean, they're the only ones that we really ride around on a regular, which tells you, <laughs> you know, right. they are you know, so giving. You know what I'm experiencing with what you're sharing is also the same as humans. You know, I've done so many transformational courses where in and week first day, the chairs are really tight together. Everyone's like, I don't even like you. Why are you sitting next to me? I, I don't like anybody here. And everyone's energy is like, Ugh, what have I gotten myself into, right? By the time the session is over, everyone is like each other's long lost brother or sister. They're so in love because humans are truly wanting to connect. They really want to feel seen and heard. They all, just like the horses, like we all have our individual personalities and gifts. And as long as we hold that space for each other for the other person to show up everyone's love language opens up and they're all different you know I did this test where it was a controller supporter analyzer or control a supporter pr promoter analyzer or controller and I'm a promoter like super high promoter well promoters are fabulous because they're a ton of fun and they have high energy and they really could have a great time with stuff and we miss details. Like details are not our thing. <laughs> so to be in relationship with someone who's a promoter is a little bit difficult because you're like, did you bring the this? And you're like, oh, was that in the email? <laughs> <laughs> like you're walking out the door and you're like, oh, right. well, my keys, right? Yeah. But each one has its pros and cons of what's yeah. great and what's not. And yeah. I feel like when you're working with horses and you just said like they all have their different personalities and you get to love each oh, one. Yeah. Like we all have our gifts. We all have our genius zones. It's like, how do you tap into what makes that person so individually unique and beautiful? Yeah. And it is, and that's a role as a leader too. So when I'm doing speaking, this is all stuff, like all the things we're covering are all things that I talk about when I come out and do my speaking events and I have some awesome videos and pictures and stuff that go with everything. But, you know, that's what we need. That's what a good leader is. It doesn't matter if it's with a horse. It doesn't matter if it's with a person. It's being able to recognize that. It's being able to recognize every everyone has different personalities and their pros and cons. Everyone has their own personality traits. Everyone has what makes them tick. And being able to dial in those different people. There's a lot of people just like with horses. There's a lot of horses that technically get flunked out of programs. They're like, no, they're never going to make the cut. That horse just doesn't have what it takes. That horse doesn't know how to do this. That horse can't handle pressure. Whose fault is that? <laughs> right? Like then you're applying your pressure incorrectly. And I think this happens in jobs a lot too is if we don't take the time to develop a relationship with a person, uh, with an employee or a coworker, how do we know? How do we know what, what, how do we know how to help them? How do we know how to help them flourish? How do we know, you know, what kind of pressure, right? Like we talk, I talk about this with horses all the time is some people let's, let's make a Bobby and a Betty. Okay. Like I don't care, but let's say Bobby is that guy at work, that employee that, you know, you're going to just have to go into the office and be like, Bobby, this needs to be done right now, today. Thank you. And then you have Betty that you just know that when you give Betty this report and tell her that she 
circled that wrong, that she's going to cry and it's just going to be this whole thing. Okay. You cannot, number one, you have to be able to evaluate where they are at. Okay. So let's say here's Bobby. I mean, we know we have to put a ton of pressure on Bobby to get every, anything done. Well, what happens to that relationship? You come in hot and heavy because you know that's what it requires to get it done. Well, Bobby is going to eventually quit or hate his job and hate life, you know, or he will work there forever and continue to hate life. Or, But it's going to get to a point for you as the leader that when you come in, Bobby, I need this done right now today. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. So you're going to have to fire Bobby right? Because he just, he's not getting it anymore. There's such a, like, you just created this issue, right? So being able to evaluate where they are. Okay. Here's Bobby right now. And every time I go to Bobby's office, I have to slap that paper down. Why? Get to know Bobby. Number one, develop a relationship. Find out how Bobby works. Find out who he is. Find out you know, th without that relationship, you can't know anything about it. And you come in, you apply this pressure and expect it to stick. You don't know, you know, and if you come in hot and heavy, again, you can only come in hot and heavy so many times before that hot and heavy isn't hot and heavy anymore. It doesn't mean anything. Totally. So you have to be able to. Our children, I have two very different children. Right. Same thing for parenting, right? It's just relationships. This is how right. all relationships are. But if we want to be able to grow that relationship, you have to take it where it is. And again, like actually develop it, put some time, put some energy, put some effort. And if you're like, man, they're just the most draining person I've tried. You're lying to yourself to make yourself feel better because we all want what? We all want connections. We all want relationships. We all want the same things. We all want love. We all want to show up and feel accepted. So, exactly. you know, you're missing a piece, go find it, go diggy, and then adjust your pressure skill. So- exactly. You know? Well, you're, we're leading right into where I was going to be taking this. How do people get to work with you? <laughs> so right now I'm doing life coaching so people can call me. Um, I have a website up, sjtalks.com. They can check that out. It's, that gives all the information on speaking and my life coaching program. So that's, that's you know, hire me for a speaking event. I would absolutely love to come out and share the more details. You know, we never really got to dig into and that's okay. But my family that passed away each individually, we got into my dad's a little bit, but my sister has, even though she passed away at not even four years old, she's an incredible story that will give you absolute shivers. My brother that was my best friend that passed away as well. I mean, his story will give you chills down your spine that like will last you, I promise, for a lifetime. It's lasted me a lifetime. I have people that I came and spoke for that still text day and I spoke from last year or whatever and they were like man I'm still thinking today I was having a bad day and I started thinking about the story you shared about your brother and it just turned my day around and same thing with my sister's story I, I get messages emails you know man that turned my day around today I saw this I won't give away all the details because I'd love to do more speaking events for people and actually get the pictures and to share but um yeah I mean there's some wonderful beautiful stuff that we get into that we're, we probably won't get into today but yeah speaking so Check out sjtalks.com. You can find me on Facebook. Reach out. But I'd love to come speak or life coaching. Everything we just talked about here. If, you, if you're listening to this and you're like, I need to work on my mindset or I'd love to have that mindset, right? Positivity scale is great. Lots of things are great. But I want to take where you're at and help you find for you because we just talked about everybody's an individual, I want to help you find as an individual, and I'll give you the resources. I'll help you find what resources work for you to build that mindset that you want, whether you want to, I mean, and that just is going to affect, like affect and influence every aspect of life. Business, personal. And, okay. and I think it's one of those areas that, you know, when you resonate with someone and you really tap into who they are and how, what they did moves you take action like sydney said something today that physically moves you and has you feel so lit up that there's a calling from inside of you that says i need to do something step into that power like yeah. get those oh i just got full body chill saying that <laughs> get those moments yeah. you know and and there are 
speaking to us loud and clear. And it's really just taking the one next step. A lot of people are like, Louisa, I need to know it. The, the, I need the whole picture before I take action. I've been doing this a while. People don't get the whole big picture. They get the very next step. That's a hundred percent right. Oh, I just got chills too. Yeah, that's so true, right? And yeah, so it's, you know, that's the way people can work with me. And I, I love helping people, no matter if they're going through something hard right now and just need some advice and some coaching with that, whether it's loss with, I mean, so many things. I mean, I've, we didn't dive into any of this too, but it's like, I mean, I've been in abusive relationships. I've been, I mean, everybody's been through their heart, right? And And mine definitely hasn't been limited to help things necessarily but you know I'm happy to help people get through things and I love that and or even just reach out for resources hey you know do you have I'm going through this do you have a good book you like I'm happy to share that information I'm not gonna you know I'm happy to, to just share with people I I found what works for me and and I, I want once you find happiness right you want to share it you want to share that feeling you want everyone on the planet no matter who they are to be able to wake up happy and be able to wake up you know rejuvenated and excited about the things that they are working on about life around them so absolutely and it's so relatable it's so human like I, i'm going back to what you said when you were six years old sitting at the park at the school playground and looking around and feeling different and knowing your life was different. And it's so relative because truthfully, like I was five when my parents moved from Armenia to America and they put me in first grade and then they came and brought me back out and put me in kindergarten. And I made up that I wasn't smart enough to be in that classroom. That's why they pulled me out. And the truth was, I didn't speak a word of English. And yeah. my parents looking back, of course they'd want to start you in kindergarten at five to to like not have me fail in life right but I made up as a young child looking around that I was embarrassed I was embarrassed that I got pulled out of class and I made up for the for that point on that I wasn't smart enough and it took me my entire life like I remember when I was pregnant and they told me my blood type was an A positive it's the first A plus of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it used to be this like horrifying thing. I had to learn to be funny with it because I just like never felt that smart. Right. And I'm like those moments in life when you're a child and you're looking around and th- feeling you're different. It doesn't matter what you're comparing it to. Absolutely. You have those moments where I'm like, I'm different. Yeah. And, and hard is hard, right? Like I have so many people that come up to me after I speak and, are, and just are like, man, like I haven't been through half of what you've been through. And I'm like, well, that's not true. Because in, in a way it's not true, right? Like, I mean, you think, like you said, I, I remind my daughter all the time. I'm, I'm like probably a strict mom in this way. Like she thinks, oh, I had her day and I should be like sympathetic. And I'm like, did you eat today? Okay, you got food. That's a thing. Okay, I think you're gonna, sorry, I apologize. I'm like, I think you're going to be fine. Like, you know, not you're going to be, but you know what I mean? Like, I always try to keep those things into perspective. But like I said, at the the, the end of the day, the reality, hard is hard. So. Right. And it's relative. It's hard and it's relative. Because yeah, and it's relative, right? So I'm like, like, that's something I've learned too, is I'm like, you're still experiencing the same emotions I'm experiencing, right? Like, you're, you're still sad or you're still, this thing is still hard for you. It's not like there's levels of, I mean, in a way, but not because my girlfriend had um cancer and she was given fifteen percent chance to live, and like we were all traumatized watching her go through it. And then I said to her years later, after she had recovered and she's in you know remission, the whole bit, I said, "Wow, you know, of all the people who gets to have a hall pass, a feeling like they got it handed to them, I give it to you." And she goes, "Why? I didn't feel any different than you all these years." She goes, "I don't know why you would say that." And it was mind blowing to me because to her, she was just making it through each day. Like I was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's how I felt too. And I can honestly say, so I've had cancer twice now. And I can honestly say that having my loved ones have cancer was personally for me, 10 times harder than, than me going through it. Because for me, I know I'm, I know I'm okay. 
you know, like, I, or I, or I know, even if I'm not okay, right? Like, it's harder to feel like someone that you love and not that I don't love, but you know what I mean? Like your loved ones are going through hard and, and you can only do so much, you know, and just I'm knowing that they're experiencing that is so difficult. Yeah. You know what it re- kind of reminded me of like, when I first got pregnant with my kids, I remember thinking, oh my- oh my God, I just need to make it to the first trimester. I like, if I make it, then I'll feel safe. And then I was like, well, I just need to get, have a healthy baby. I'm just going to give birth and then I'll feel safe. And then I was like, I just need to take, like have them get to three months and then, and then I'll know I got this and they're like, no more infant and I'll be okay. And then I was like, it didn't stop. Yeah. 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 I, would, I would drive and be like, oh my God. And, and I would be in panic of like how it was going. Cause I was so afraid for the next moment. Yeah. One day I realized that too long lit in (laughs) really, it was really far into the parenting where I realized this is not, this, this is the never ending shit show. Yeah. (laughs) It's so (laughs) true. I'm going to stop right now. Yeah. And I'm going to appreciate just this moment. They're all alive. I'm alive. They're alive. No one's sitting. I used to like think that I was going to hit the center divider and everybody was going to be out. (laughs) I had to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and again, that's just how it is with everything in life, right? When we real when we step back and we realize because we do, we sit in hyper fixate, right? Like, oh, there's people that are like, oh, so I, well, when I get a nice house or if I get this nice car or if I get this thing. And or you know, I mean, it could be, if I'm in a relationship, if I get married, I'll be happy. I mean, there's so many lies we tell ourselves, right? Like happiness has nothing to do with these things. It just doesn't. But but we try, right? We try to hit these like we try to set these things in our and because to be honest, in a way, that's easier. Why is that easier? Because we have an excuse. We have an excuse like I I can't be happy right now because I just need that thing to happen. Right. Well, then we don't have to have any accountability for it because I'm working towards that thing really hard. Like I'm working my butt off to get that car. So and it's going to happen. And then and in a year I'm going to have that car. And then I can like then I know I'll be happy. You don't have to hold yourself accountable today for trying to make like what makes you happy or how do I find that or how do I work on that or you know what I mean? Like it's just it's this it's this lie we sit and feed into for ourselves that like that's, you know, it's, it's, I just, there. I just want everyone to like rewind back, take notes, circle what you said, <laughs> because I think that's mind blowing. Like that is so huge. So anyone listening and really wants the tools to put into effect of like what she said, literally rewind back, listen to that, <laughs> take notes and just do it. And then reach out to Sydney and tell her your results. Like, yeah. Just start there. like just do that part and then reach out to her because yeah. nothing, nothing is more gratifying when someone actually learns something that you shared and then does it and then reaches back out and says this this worked yeah absolutely yeah and if you get stuck on this is not working call me I'd love to do life coaching with you it's it's an yeah. absolute blast and I love getting to know these like people individually and they hear their story Absolutely. One of my favorite things when I get done speaking is when I get to go mingle with everyone that, you know, I just spoke with and hear their stories and everyone's like, oh, I can relate because my grandma, you know, however that, that resonated with them. Like, I love connecting with people. I love hearing their story. I love, and if there's anything I can help and do to help them, I, you know, it's, I, there's a podcast I listened to too, where he said the most true thing the other day. And I was like, man, that is that's a good way to say that. And he said, helping other people is truly the most selfish thing we can do. <laughs> I <laughs> tell people that all the time. I, like, when I'm coaching, I'm like, listen, I'm here for you all. But really, when you succeed, I'm succeeding. And I'm so, so selfish. <laughs> I am so doing it because the better you do, the better I feel. So like, I, I almost feel guilty loving it as much as right? I do. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel. Like, yeah, I feel the same way. Like, and because you do, it makes you happy when you get to make others happy. So it's like, I mean, the other day when you called me to tell, tell me the story about the intention and how it worked and we didn't get to get into that today, you made my entire day. 
Yeah. You made my entire day because there's oh, and the gift we get to give other people when we share is huge because that you sharing with me that day was so beautiful. It so impacted my heart and my day and my life of like, this is why I do what I do because there's people in the world who like reach back out to me and share how that landed and nothing, nothing like is that exciting until you get that. Yeah, I, yes, I totally a hundred percent agree. So thank you so, so much for, for sharing. And it's so, it was so fun to connect. I wish we lived closer to Louisa because I'd love to connect with you more often, but. Me too. Well, you're going to be flying out here one day to hang yes. out. We're definitely doing that. Thank you so much for your thank time. You. This has been magical. And we get to say goodbye to everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.